Good evening. Nice to see everybody here. Um, let me add my thanks to the Scripps Foundation for Science and the Environment for their generous support of the Greenovation Forum, and thanks to our other Sustainability Solutions Institute donors, partners, and friends. Tonight's topic is nature and sustainability. Many wise people before us have recognized the value of nature. Aristotle, who lived between 384 and 322 BCE, said, if one way be better than another, that, you may be sure, is nature's way. And his contemporary Chinese philosopher Lao Tzu said, nature does not hurry, yet everything is accomplished. More recently, we've had other wisdom on the subject from Albert Einstein, who is quoted as saying, look deep into nature and then you will understand everything better. So this is the inspiration for our program tonight. As we face the challenge of growing world population, increased demand for material goods, and a finite planetary system, we too must be wise and look deep into nature. Nature has had 3.8 billion years to work this out, to figure out the designs that work and to discard the ones that don't. Tonight's program is designed to give you some glimpses into the research that's done here at UCSD and elsewhere in uncovering those, nature, those design solutions that nature has developed and learning how to apply them to human societal challenges. But research isn't enough. We don't just want journal articles, although we do want them. Um, we don't just want theories about nature-inspired solutions. We want to explore how to go beyond the discoveries of research and take those nature-inspired or nature-based solutions and turn them into products and processes and companies and jobs and cures and sustainable progress. In doing so, we reinforce what I hope you already believe, that nature is not separate and apart from human society. Nature is essential to the survival of human society. So our three speakers, their bios are printed on the back of your programs. Um, Bill Fenickel from Scripps Institution of Oceanography is an academic science entrepreneur with an active research portfolio in marine natural products chemistry and a business portfolio of several companies that he started. He will describe his work in developing drugs from the sea and commercializing his discoveries. Paula Brock is a nonprofit science entrepreneur who joins us from the San Diego Zoological Society. She will give an overview of biomimicry and describe the work of the zoo in partnership with companies and research organizations to promote San Diego as a hub of biomimicry. And Judy Mueller-Cohen is a corporate science entrepreneur, having used her scientific training in the private sector in life sciences before she founded the company Biomatrica, where she serves as CEO. She will tell the Biomatrica story, which is a, truly a success story of learning from nature, solving a human societal challenge based on the lessons of a fairy shrimp. After each of the speakers has given his or her presentation, we'll invite them to come up to the table and take questions from the audience. And so with that, welcome Bill Fenickel, please. Thank you very much, Lisa. Can everyone hear me in the audience? Looks like it. Okay. So, so far not so good. Um, uh -huh. Separate computer. Well, <clears throat> looking around, I see this word green uh, ovation form. Well, at least for my talk, I'd like to rename that blue ovation. Uh, because we have enormous resources uh, in the ocean. Seventy percent of the earth is blue. It's the ocean, and it's deep, and it's extraordinarily complex biologically, and affords for us in the future the opportunity to develop a wide variety of products, new products that we haven't seen before, and to bring the ocean as a natural resource into uh, our ability to commercialize. I'm a member and director of the Center for Marine Biotechnology and Biomedicine at SIO here on the campus. 
and you can read faster than I can talk. We are interested in understanding the diversity of the ocean, exploiting those resources in the ocean for the treatment of human diseases, for other purposes as well, but to truly understand what this resource means. And as you might expect, there has been very little research over centuries in the area of the ocean, mainly because I think scientists were uh, a little frightened of the ocean, uh, and some still are. So we have established at CMBB a drug discovery program that is unusual for an oceanographic institution in that it is funded exclusively or almost exclusively by the National Institutes of Health. And these are some of the members, and we all have joint relationships with not only with SIO, but with the uh, Cancer Center, the, the, the new Skag School of Pharmacy and Pharmaceutical Sciences. And by creating those cross-disciplinary uh, both appointments and relationships, we have opportunities to be very sophisticated in these areas of medicine, to actually know clinicians who can translate some of our work into treatments and hopefully cures in our own hospitals, for example. So one of the things I want to talk about goes way back into the times when uh, notable figures in medicine, the pioneers in medicine, uh, such as Alexander Fleming in 1929, the discovery of penicillin. There was no greater scientific discovery now, till then, than the discovery of penicillin. This drug has saved hundreds of millions of lives over the lifetime and created enormous commercial activities in the pharmaceutical industry and so on. And so this was the foundation. This was the ultimate, in my view, of using the evolutionary consequences of chemistry in nature, applying it to human needs, and ultimately to develop commercial activities and, and essentially all of the pharmaceutical industries in Europe, Japan, worldwide, in the US, uh, depended upon the uh, use of natural resources, of, of microorganisms that were found in the soil for the development of commercial product. There's hundreds of antibiotics, there's cancer drugs, there's, there's cholesterol-lowering uh, drugs, lovastatin, for example. All of these came from studies of the soil and what inhabitants occur in the soil. It's also a very clean kind of technology because these drugs are produced by fermentation not by chemistry, using oftentimes very harsh reagents, all ultimately depending upon the use of crude oil. And so this, with this history in mind, uh, we began to think about where we are now. In 1990, the pharmaceutical industry abandoned, the, the, the essentially abandoned the discovery or searching for new antibiotic materials. Since that time, this has become a medical epidemic. The onslaught of drug-resistant pathogenic bacteria, uh, one of the major ones being MRSA, methicillin-resistant Staphylococcus aureus. But this is just the tip of the iceberg of drug resistance. Many, many diseases, battlefield diseases now, are drug-resistant, and we're having trouble with simple wounds, treating simple infectious diseases of the skin, for example, but also pneumonia and other kinds of diseases, different sorts of diseases. And so where are we going? What can we do? And, and how are we going to open the field of antibiotics and other drugs as well? Well, for example, here's the rise of resistance in methicillin-resistant Staphylococcus aureus as of 2003-2004. It's now 88% of all Staph aureus isolated from communities are drug-resistant and very difficult to treat. And no doubt, either you've had one of these infections or you know people that have had them, and they're devastating and they're very difficult to treat. Another alarming statistic is shown here. This is the rate of new antibiotic discovery and approval. Last year and this year, none. 
The last drug that was truly a novel drug was in the year 2000, and this was a drug called linazolid, which was a new type of drug, truly something new, but nothing has followed. There are no drugs being developed for this purpose. So here's a place we might think we could look. The ocean was never explored, despite 70 years of microbiology, biologists looking at every conceivable location on the planet, we never once questioned whether the ocean would be a reasonable resource for these kinds of microorganisms. For, for organisms producing new antibiotics, there was no question. And you can see it's an enormous resource. The bottom sediments, which of course compose 70% of the earth, contain a billion microbial cells per sugar cube, cubic centimeter. Enormous numbers, and we really know so very little about what they are and how we might be able to use them. When you consider the vastness of these oceans and the different types of oceans, from tropical oceans to temperate uh, to Arctic oceans, uh, and you realize that in a stratified ocean that the microbiology of the surface changes completely at 100 meters, another complete change at two, 300 meters, and as you move down to the bottom, the microbiology becomes infinitely complex. And so this is a resource we really don't understand yet in its entirety. But we're taking a look. So here's the bottom of the ocean. Quite an unexciting place to be, clearly. I have trouble convincing anyone that they should work here. Uh, it's mud. Uh, and of course, once in a while you see an invertebrate and, and the oceanographers get excited about that because maybe it's a new species and so on and so forth. But what about the mud? What's in there and why wouldn't we be incredibly enthusiastic about the microbiology of the mud? Part of the problem has been collecting these muds. We really can't just jump down to 4,000 meters, at least not economically. The Alvin submarine there is $40,000 a day, and you can make a few collections, but you have to have a support ship with it, and that's another $25,000 a day. And so the Alvin is not really a functional way, or any submersible is a functional way to reach the bottom of the ocean. So what have we done to try and improve that situation? Well, we've tried to design sampling devices. You can see some of them here. Some of them are tethered to the surface, and we simply drop these uh, missile-looking uh, tubes, and they fall, free fall to the bottom to three, four, 5,000 meters of depth, for example. And then we pull them back up with these large electric reels that uh, will be able to retrieve them. This works pretty well, but there's a limit. And so we've also designed these untethered sampler devices you see on the right, where there's nothing connected to the surface. The idea is to build a device that will free fall, and when it reaches the bottom, it will collect a sample, bring it back to the surface, uh, by dropping some counterweights. And uh, what you can see here is how that works. Pretty, pretty difficult to see, but anyway, I think there's the counterweight dropping, and now it goes back up to the surface. And to give you some idea of how long this takes, it's 40 minutes each direction, free falling. So it takes an hour and a half or something, you're waiting around, and then finally this thing pops up on the surface. It's also pretty slow and pretty difficult. But no matter that, we're able now to collect bottom samples, as you see here, uh, in stratified tubes. And these can, we've collected them down to five, six, 6,000 meters, which is very deep. And uh, we're now able to study these organisms and ask some questions. So this is just a biology diversity graph of microorganisms of one class called the actinomycetes. 80% of the antibiotics we have come from soil, from soil actinomycetes. So show you you can culture them, culture them on salt. Uh, and what happens? Well, here's the first example 
of a compound that we encountered being produced by these organisms. And this was an extremely potent inhibitor of cancer cell growth. It also had a very novel mechanism of how it uh, killed cancer cells. <clears throat> and so we began to develop this. And at the very same time, uh, we had developed this technology of collecting and understanding the resource in the bottom of the ocean. <clears throat> I had an opportunity to become a founder of Narius Pharmaceuticals here in San Diego. And one of the things that Narius decided to do was to license this drug candidate from the university in 2003. And uh, it is now well on its way for the treatment of a number of, of cancers, including multiple myeloma, which was the original target for this kind of a drug. It's now in phase two clinical trials and doing quite well, actually. So this was the first example, and <clears throat> Narius began to grow. It began to look at our discoveries, and it began to license from the university. Probably 10 licenses ultimately were taken. And here's another drug that we discovered that is, uh, was modified by Narius to make a slight derivative. And this is a drug that is an excellent drug that will be effective against breast cancer and also ovarian cancer. And the way it acts is novel. It goes inside the tumor, and for reasons that we don't understand, <clears throat> it destroys the blood vessels in the center of the tumor, and the tumor begins to die. So this was also licensed. It's now in phase two uh, clinical trials. So here's some of the people that uh, are in Narius. Uh, I'm a founder and scientific advisor. Uh, it was an interesting road, but it is a biotech road, which is uh, in many ways not a long-term road. Uh, Narius now is in development mode completely, no longer in the discovery mode. They have two drugs that are doing well. And so we're now working with other investors to develop this resource for antibiotics, also for additional anti-cancer agents. and. Uh, you know, with some apprehension because this is not an easy thing to do for faculty in the university. There are many problems which you might, we might talk about when there's Q&A. Uh, but all in all, the way we feel is if we can develop something that benefits our community here, and by bringing new technologies forward, we're excited about that challenge. Thanks very much. Good afternoon, everyone. It's very nice to be here. I'm honored. Uh, I have to make a confession. I'm a chief financial officer. So you guys, all you scientists out there, um, please, I humbly uh, present myself to you. Uh, but um, I, I think that's going to come on pretty soon. Yep. But I, uh, I am chief financial officer of the San Diego Zoo, which is the world's largest zoo. Uh, we have the largest collection of plants and animals anywhere. Uh, we are about to have our 100th anniversary, and we're proud to be an icon in the city and in the region. Um, we are the stewards of nature. We have a very important job that we hold at the San Diego Zoo. We have about 5 million people that come through our gate every year. At the peak of our season, we employ about 3,000 employees, and we get about 15 million web hits a year. So we have the ability to influence, and we can take that very seriously. Um, we are a living library. Uh, we have thousands of species, and that's just a fraction of the species that exist in the world. So. Um, we're in the business of saving species. That's what we do. And many of you didn't know that that's what you do. we do because you just come through and see us as having uh, providing passive exhibitry. But we've moved on a little bit be beyond that, and I'd like to explain that to you. Um, what we have here is a chart that is telling us about the world's economy since the year one to about now. Uh, that's GDP per capita, and you can see in the last 150 years or so, things have changed a little bit. And um, the growth of the economy has been profound. And in that process, the growth has involved primarily the consumption of natural resources. 
For our scientists at the San Diego Zoo, uh, being that their business is saving species, um, it's, it, this is becoming a problem for us. We're in 35 countries around the world and we're doing about 100 projects dealing with thousands of species. And in addition to that, we have 100 years worth of husbandry, plant and animal husbandry, that we bring to the table for anyone to come and learn about. Um, the problem is that the rate of species is declining faster than the leading conservation organizations can save them. Um, man is certainly part of the problem, but he also is going to be the solution. A smarter approach to the environment and the economy is the solution. This is a great opportunity, and you're going to hear me talk a lot about economy and environment. They have to be spoken of together. Um, about three years ago, my colleague, John Prangy, gave me a book called Natural Capitalism. And being an accountant, it was music to my ears because nature and capitalism was a really happy thing. Because I don't know if any of you have ever seen the movie or the, the musical Oklahoma, but can't the farmers and the ranchers get along? Well, that's kind of the way it is with the scientists and the environmentalists and the business people. It's as though they can't get along. And they can get along. In fact, they have to get along. And that's the basic premise of this book, that environmental sustainability and economic economic sustainability are synergistic, need to be synergistic. And there's four core strategies that, that the uh, authors suggest. One is radical resource productivity. That makes sense on both counts. It costs less money to operate with more. Uh, uh, it, it costs less money to operate with less, excuse me. 94% of Everything we produce is actually wasted. Only 6% remains in the product or the process. So we are grossly unproductive. That results in higher operating costs and the requirement for much greater capital. Um, the service and flow economy. Uh, that shifts from the, ac the focus from the acquisition of assets to the provision of service. We don't necessarily need to own everything, although we're trained to, to do that. Um, we need to get from point A to point B. That doesn't necessarily mean we need to own a car. We need clean clothes. That doesn't necessarily mean we need to have a washing machine. So the provision of service can create great efficiencies. Uh, biomimicry was one of them. And that was like a ding, ding, ding for me being in my job. Biomimicry is innovation inspired by nature. When we look at nature, we're in awe because there is no waste. You walk through a forest, there is no waste. The leaves become the food of something else. It's all closed loop. There are no power, ugly power plants in nature. There are no ugly landfills in nature. Man's figured that part out. So now it's our job to look to nature, and we'll talk a little bit more, of course, about this, but the, because the design solutions already exist. It's, it's using our genius now to stop working in such an arrogant manner in a way that we feel the necessity to dominate and to work in a humbler man manner where we actually stop just passively uh, uh, observing the animals and plants and actually look to them for what they hold to give us, to tell us. The solutions for the environment need to be creative, strategic, and inclusive. Key word, inclusive. The economy cannot be excluded from talk about the environment and the environment cannot be excluded from talk about the economy. We've seen the problems that that has caused. This is where we're living right now. <clears throat> Many of the materials, products, processes, and designs in the current economy were inherited from a generation where resources were abundant. The idea of waste wasn't even part of the equation. And clearly, we all know that's not the case now as well. I need to, okay. <clears throat> Why biomimicry? Well, it has the, the potential to transform nearly every industry, from consumer goods, adhesives, the good old gecko, transportation, the box fish, sports, the shark, alternative energy, the whale flipper, technology, the peacock, the butterfly, architecture, the termite hill, engineering, the calla lily, nanotechnology, medicine, manufacturing, it crosses all spectrums. It's enormous. We not only have the need, we have the 
absolute opportunity to redesign everything in a more sustainable way. Nature is sustainable, creative, and efficient. And it provides inspiration for new materials, designs, products, processes that are sustainable. As I say, there is no waste. It's closed loop. Um, this offers a potential for a dramatic reduction in the depletion of natural resources, while also providing for the opportunities for economic growth. Biomimicry, which is nature-inspired sustainable innovation, is an effective model for innovation and conservation because it is inclusive. It offers a solution that includes the environment and the economy. And I can't emphasize that enough. Even today in my own organization, we had a Futures of the Zoos conference, and it was fascinating. And people were, came from all around the world. But the economic reality wasn't discussed enough. And that's something that has to happen. People are not going to do things if it doesn't make economic sense for them. We've seen it. We're living it. And what we're suggesting is that through biomimicry, it can not only make economic sense, it can create greater economic profit. The more efficiently we can produce products, the more human efforts we can put towards better service. Being green does not need to, to be a doomsday or a gloomy scenario. OK, why now? <clears throat> why is now the time for biomimicry? Well, there's this amazing convergence, or some will call it a perfect storm. Clearly, the Earth is going through global change. Just look around. Just look at, 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 at satellite pictures or aerial photos. The world is changing. There's new high technology opportunities. Computer simulations and virtual reality. Clean tech. Nanotech. A global economy that used to be competitive and now is just falling apart. Radical resource productivity has been demonstrated by several companies that are, that are doing it. Biomatrica is here as one of them is going to talk about it. Green chemistry. Cons conservation, is, conservation of our resource is a critical top of mind issue for everyone right now. It's all over. Being inspired by nature has always been happening as we look at nature with tremendous awe because of its outstanding beauty. But what is different now is that we have both the need to design sustainable solutions and the capabilities to do so through science, economy, and environment. We can understand the beauty of nature as we never have before, even at the nano level. With computer simulations, we have the need, capability, and mindset to change everything for better. And the reason we mention that is we've got a whole generation of kids that are used to being on the computer and being able to control, alt, delete, and reboot and start over again. This is a different mindset than before, where it was, well, this is the way we've always, always done things before, and it has been harder to change. I must point out, however, that there, nothing can replace the real thing. When you're in a room with a koala, or you're um, around an okapi making a sound, a koala, em a koala emitting its scent, um, or an armadillo and feeling, feeling what the texture is like or different plants, you need to be around the real thing. In many cases, you cannot get that from a computer simulation or a reality. So being in a place where there is a living library becomes essential for the dif this, different, this type of innovation and inspiration. <clears throat> uh, and, and what does this mean? Well. Dollars, coins. Um, this is transformational change, we believe. And maybe the objective can change from consumption to efficient and sustainable utilization of natural resources. This can result in, and this is kind of something that a lot of people get angry with me when I say it, but this can result in an abundance from efficient practices that result in growing profits, new business models, and opportunities. In many ways, we've kind of decided in, that, it's, that it, we have to make do with less. And what we're suggesting with biomimicry and using these kinds of, of models and inspirations is that we don't have to make do with less. In fact, it's about living better by living smarter. My hope is that before too long, we can replace the word conservation with restoration. And we do believe that's possible. 
Again, in town we have some real-life examples. We've got our friends right down the street at Qualcomm that have invented the uh, display, the Mirasol display, that's based on, um, on butterfly technology. And we have our friends at Biomatrica, and we're going to be hearing about them from Judy in just a minute. Okay. Why ZSSD? Why global economy? Why am I talking about these things? Because we have to. As I said, we're in the business of save, saving species. One of the main contributors to the loss of biodiversity is the threat to their natural habitat. The natural habitat is being threatened because of the non-sustainable consumption of natural resources, depletion. Biodiversity is in a downward spiral and there is need for transformational change. Biomimicry offers creative, sustainable, efficient ideas that can positively impact the economy, the habitat, and therefore biodiversity. And you can see we're saying bio, uh, biomimicry reduces consumption, enhances natural habitat, restores, restores species diversity. So what's our role? <clears throat> well, we have the expertise to share nature's wonderful stories at levels that will capture the imagination of the public and provide inspiration to the designers, scientists, inventors who are creating tomorrow's so in sustainable solutions. As I said, we have a 100-year history. We have keepers that, that have stories and knowledge about plants and animals that far surpass anybody. It's, it's like it is their babies. We have an institution. Institute for Conservation Science, where we're in 35 countries doing 100 field projects on 1,000 plus species. We can tell the story. We have media. We have 5 million people that come through a year. And we can have people come around the table, and we can facilitate the design around the table. This helps our efforts to save species. Why San Diego? Well, San Diego. Of course, we have the world-famous San Diego Zoo. But we have our partnership with the city of San Diego and a willingness to, part, to work and collaborate in this area. San Diego has already demonstrated its ability to, to create a hub, the hub for, bio, for biotech, the hub for wireless. We have great universities like the University of California, San Diego State, USD, PLNU. We are in a biodiversity hotspot ourselves, and we have the desert and ocean. We have Scripps and SeaWorld, so we have the marine world. And it doesn't hurt that we're a major tourist destination. People like to come here. So we believe that it's happening. Um, we believe that this is an enormous wave that's coming. Uh, we know the media attention is growing. We just had a conference in October. We were blown over by the national media that is interested in this business and science. New companies are being formed. Fortune 500 companies are coming to us asking for our help, so we know it's serious. Um, we are intend to have a conference again in the fall of this year. Please contact us. We have information outside if you would like to get information about our conference. And our vision is to connect people to wildlife and conservation. We believe at the San Diego Zoo, through biomimicry, we will play a crucial role in connecting human problems with nature's solutions. I thank you very much for having me today. My story is a, sort of a personal story. Um, I'm actually an entomologist by training who is now a businesswoman. And the story of Biomatrica is biomimicry. It comes from a need uh, that scientists have today. I have to find this. So biomimicry has opened the door for us to discover novel ways to store samples at room temperature. Those are samples. Sorry. It's hard to press the. There we go. Here we go. Um, in biology labs today, in the life sciences, we're living in a time of the industrialization of biology. It's the time when we've seen the human genome sequenced. You can't hear me. The human genome sequenced. And many other genomes sequenced. Well, out of that comes 
a plethora of samples that are stored in minus 80 and minus 20 degrees centigrade freezers, like this one here, an overfrosted freezer. Um, there are not only hundreds, but millions of samples stored this way on a weekly basis now. Every scientist has had this situation. I personally had a freezer breakdown one night and lost many of my samples because it defrosted and it was a puddle of water in the morning. Um, these are cold chain logistics. This is expensive, often unreliable, um, difficult to monitor. Samples that go through freeze-thaw often degrade, so that's not a good way to save samples. And it's difficult to scale. You think about samples that have to be shipped and shipped overseas in large styrofoam boxes filled with dry ice. It's very expensive and it's not good for the environment. Here's a picture of a freezer farm. This is a company here in San Diego that stores many kits that they sell as well as reagents that they use for their own research. So there are actual farms and biobanks and biorepositories that are filled with these freezers. They're expensive. You have to monitor them. And the samples are always at risk. At risk for breakdown, at risk for freeze-thaw. So Biomatrica, we looked for novel ways to solve our own problems, um, to stabilize samples without the need for freezers. And we looked to nature to do it. It's true biomimicry. There are organisms that you see this little blue animal, it's a tardigrade or a water bear, and there are many organisms that have this biology. There are many insects that have this biology as well. Um, they can dry up and preserve their DNA, RNA, cells, proteins for over a hundred years. And with a drop of water and the sands of the Sahara, moisture will seep into those sands. They rehydrate and they come back to life. And it is this biology that we took and mimicked with synthetic chemistry to develop products to stabilize samples at room temperature. And what you see here under the tardigrade is how we've taken, and it's a true paradigm shift, of how to store these samples. Um, scientists aren't used to pulling their samples out of a freezer and leaving them on the bench top. That's, that's a huge shift in thinking. They love their freezers. You know, we're trained to um, keep freezers going for decades. So it's a very, very different way to manage samples, but a very important way when you have many samples and very valuable samples. So what we did was we took um, and mimicked the natural compounds. What you see on the left is a DNA molecule with disaccharides in it. The blue is their disaccharides, and they stabilize the DNA molecule. We copied those with synthetic chemistry, and on the right you see the DNA with the green molecules. That's our technology. That's one of our matrices that stabilize the DNA molecule. And further on the right you see an electron micrograph showing the dark spots are DNA surrounded by sample matrix. It's called the sample matrix technology. Um, which forms a glass-like structure around the DNA. It keeps it stable from heat, UV, uh, and can live on the bench top. So we've used um, some methodologies for discovering new molecules. Um, we've taken what nature does and we mimic it. We use uh, computer modeling to match structure with chemistry. That's what you see on the lower right. Um, and then we do standard screening that you'll see in a drug discovery lab. And what we've done is we've made products where it's very, very simple to use. Um, we actually take formulations and spot them into a very simple device like this. Uh, and this can hold 96 DNA samples, different ones. So it's really very simple to use. Uh, the sample is just applied into each one of the wells here. and then it rehydrates the matrix that's inside, and that wraps around the DNA molecule, or it can be an RNA molecule, depending on the product, and dries down. And then the samples are just stored away on a bookshelf. When the scientist wants to use those samples, they just add water, and it is that simple. You just add water, you have your sample ready to use for whatever kind of genomic study or drug discovery that you want to do. So we have lots of products. Um, as a biologist, I know that you can't just study DNA, you study RNA, you study proteins and cells. And so Biomatrica was founded here in San Diego. We've uh, been in business for five years, and we're developing product lines that can address um, 
At this point, 50% are what is in the freezer right now in the hallways of UCSD, DNA, RNA, proteins, and cells. Um, we have a lot of products that we have. Um, we replace freezers with cabinets, dry storage cabinets that shrink the footprint uh, in the laboratory so they don't have to store them in the hallways. And in addition, all of our products have barcodes that help to get labs up and running and organized very quickly. So last year, Stanford, um, their sustainability department had wanted to look at and made, they made a, co a comparison between cold storage and our room temperature technology. And they made financial calculations. And like Paula was saying, you know, there has to be a financial plus to use these biomimicry products or to make products anyway. So did that just switch on its own? There we go. So what they found at Stanford was by using room temperature storage, they could save $16 million, and it was a very conservative model over 10 years, cut down on by 200,000 million BTUs, uh, 18,000 metric tons of CO2, and get a two-year return on investment if they implemented the technology, and now they have rolled out a program to do so. Their number one issue at Stanford was to cut down on CO2 emissions. They are truly addressing uh, trying to become a sustainable campus. Now UCSD I think is, is way ahead of them actually. So this is an example of how this technology is very green. You can see here um, the typical way to store a sample is in a minus 80 freezer. Um, there's a, the energy consumption of one minus 80 freezer is typically uh, what it takes to run one household for one year. Uh, it's a, a lot of CO2 and the equivalent of 4.7 cars on the road for a year. So to, um, to equate this, it's equivalent to 7.5 acres of trees are required to counter the emissions of one freezer. It's a lot of CO2. So we truly believe in really addressing sustainable sample management um, to reduce energy consumption, to reduce carbon footprint is very important, and to cut, cut uh, costs and also be prepared for a disaster. Very often scientists in a lab, if there is a disaster, if there's an earthquake here, they can't get back into the building to get these valuable samples. These are their biological assets. You have to go back to the freezer with a bucket of dry ice, get the samples out, and then walk out, or try and wheel a freezer out. Um, during Katrina, I know of some scientists whose lab they could not get into. They had to helicopter in for some very valuable samples during that time. So it's very, you know, these, are, these are important samples. Our products are important not only to academic researchers, but also to forensic scientists. I actually just came back from an American Association of Forensic Scientists conference where, of course, they have a lot of DNA samples in freezers. So they're, they're transforming their labs now to room temperature storage. Um, Biobanks, as well as pharmaceutical and biotech companies who have a lot of, of samples. So the products can help to reduce also on shipping cost. Um, here's an example of how we typically ship a sample. Um, from San Diego to New York, it's about $175 with that box of dry ice. And very often the tubes are very small, like you see at the top. These are small little tubes um, filling this big box. Now hopefully someone's put a lot of those tubes in there. With room temperature storage in a small device, this biomimicry this, this copy of nature, you put a stamp on it and put it in the mail, and you don't have to worry about it. So UCSD is a sustainable campus, and there are some people in the audience um, who've actually really started a program in changing the labs here at uh, UCSD. Um, John Dilliot and Bob Newhart are here somewhere, I think. And they've been really instructive in financing this transition for UCSD scientists to cut down on their carbon footprint, cut down on the space that they use, and then as well as secure their samples. So the reason I have the desert here is because this is really a desert product. Um, the biology department has implemented uh, room temperature sample storage and has been able to recycle a freezer. So the university got money back from the uh, utilities companies for this. So there's CO2 emission cut down, 
cost savings achieved, and samples are safely stored. So nature has led the way to sustainable solutions. Um, by, at Biomatrica, we do follow nature, and we're leading the way in the world of biostability. And we're very proud of that. We're very committed to doing something positive for the environment. I've spent my whole career trying to do something positive for the planet, both as an entomologist and now as a businesswoman. So these are truly sustainable solutions for the life sciences. And if any of you are interested, um, you can go to email me or go to our website and um, see what we have to offer. Thank you. Well, I think, I think you'll agree that there is some exciting research going on and we see examples of how nature really can provide us with some win-win solutions. Um, the thing I, th I think is most interesting is how I suspect none of our three speakers planned their careers to bring them to this point where Bill Fanicle probably didn't think he'd become a founder of a private company, of a, of a business. Paula probably never thought she was going to be um, spending her time with uh, corporations looking for uh, solutions from from biology and and uh, Judy probably um, also didn't know she was going to be a climate change expert and um, worry about how you measure CO2 emissions reductions and uh, carbon offsets. So I think they've demonstrated that really everything is connected to everything and we need to take a holistic approach. Whatever discipline our training is in, whatever expertise we have, it's the combination of all of these specialties and the ability to learn from each other and apply our lessons in an interdisciplinary way that really brings us to the innovations. So with that, I think you would probably rather hear from them than from me, so I would like to open the floor for questions. Do we have microphone runners or are we doing microphones? Are we? No? Okay, then if you'd like to um, ask a question, raise your hand and I will call on you and I'll ask you to stand up and identify yourself um, and ask your questions. Yes, please. Um, a question for Bill. Uh, Could you identify yourself? I'm oh. oh, wait, hang on. We do have microphones. <laughs> difficulties that uh, faculty have in translating your discoveries into products? Yeah. Well, I think <clears throat> the, the difficulties are many, but they're surmountable. That's the first comment. Uh, I think some of the difficulties are the process of transferring technology that will be the foundation of a biotech industry outside of the university. The university, of course, is quite rightly concerned that intellectual property uh, be retained by the University of California, by UCSD, uh, but recognizes that know-how and the ability to create technology is something that can be transferred to the community at will. So there's that concern, that question of what's happening with an entrepreneurial faculty member. What exactly are they doing in the industry? Are they transferring discoveries? Are they transferring know-how and information on, on, on a process? And so that's one of the first issues. Secondly, many times industries would like to provide research funds to the faculty within the university because they have clearly the most appropriate laboratory setting, the most experience, and are more capable than, than most anyone else to really explore something an industry would like to see. And in that arrangement, funds are being transferred from a company founded by a faculty member back to a faculty member in the university. And this creates the appearance, if not the reality, of conflict of interest or conflict of commitment to the, to the role of the university. So these two issues, conflict of interest and conflict of commitment, 
are two concerns the university has about faculty striking out and creating new opportunities in the community. They're not difficult activities, but they add a lot of additional review uh, for the faculty, have to constantly be questioned by committees in the Conflict of Interest Committee and so on. Uh, but I think as they are uh, an excellent uh, activity to protect the university and the faculty from this perception of conflict of interest. That's one aspect. Second aspect is whether or not there's any benefit to do so other than the altruism, other than the idea that you would in fact create jobs in San Diego in a new biotech industry and feel good that you did those things. Uh, faculty are not business people by and large. And so they are not particularly good at participating in the establishment of a company. Uh, I think public at large feels the faculty make fortunes doing this. In fact, it's just the opposite because the faculty are not doing it for profit. They're doing it because they have a dream, a commitment to their science, and they want to see that really go forward. So it's not a financial benefit uh, oftentimes to really be involved in founding a, a company. So while there are lots of other minor issues, um, example, a company could take ideas from the faculty member and go publish them on their own without the faculty member being involved. This happens every day. Uh, nonetheless, I think the overriding positive benefit is that your science, the science created the field that's created, the technology that's created, uh, has this opportunity to extend to the community in a very positive way. Thank you. Yes. Go ahead, Holly. Oh. <clears throat> Holly Garrett with Clean Talk San Diego. My question's for Paula. We have two examples today from the biotech and life science industries. Holly, can you talk about some of the companies that have approached the zoo and what they want to do with some of their some of their products? Um, some I can, some I can't. Um, but um, I, I can tell you that architectural firms have approached us, very interested in um, creating buildings that are are more efficient. And uh, there's a perfect example of a termite hill, for example, that uh, has been the inspiration for a high rise in Zimbabwe. And um, it, the, the termite hill manages to keep a constant temperature, no matter what the temperature is outside. Based on that technology of the termites, in Zimbabwe they've built this high rise that uses one-tenth of the energy in heating and cooling than the high rise next door. We also, and it's been mentioned in Fast Company, so um, we've also been working with Procter & Gamble on, on, on different areas. So uh, it's, it's big companies are seeing the, uh, the opportunities and are coming to us. Yes, this question is for Judy. Uh, Brian Can you identify Bjorndahl. yourself? Oh, sorry. Brian Bjorndahl from Assure Controls, uh, a company that um, has a biosensor using a, a small sensitive plankton as a toxicity indicator. Um, Judy, in your um, business, what are you doing to overcome the decades of um, scientific uh, uh, paradigm in terms of, of freezing? In other words, do you have an ASTM standard for what you do? What do you do so that you can basically ensure that your work is the same or their work would be the same uh, through either method? And how long has that taken to get established? So um, typically, very specifically for our products, we have to project out time that samples would actually be stable for. So we do what's called accelerated aging, which is very typical in a lot of industry, pharmaceutical being one of them, where you take a sample and you put it at different temperatures and you can project out an equivalent that a sample would be stable for at room temperature. So that's a standard when we're in development in QC. Um, where we, we look at that. And, and actually, typically, um, when a sample does degrade at a higher temperature, 
uh, the room temperature time will far surpass that because it's so extreme. So we do what is typical in, in other industries to project out shelf life, but shelf life with a sample. Um, as you can imagine, and I think you're well aware of how those equivalents, you have to share them, they have to be published in referee journal articles, and very often people have to validate for themselves. So we're at a stage in the company now where there's enough science out there that people believe they're fellow scientists um, and they don't always have to, to validate anymore. Um, but there are a lot of, you know, a lot of uh, skeptics, so you look for the early adopters, I'm sure you're well aware of that, and, and work with them. So in the forensic industry, we've been working with them for a long time. That's, that's a very difficult um, industry. But right now, what we have going on is that there are labs, very, very important early adopters, who have tested the technology and are leading the way for adoption of the, the technology into the forensic field. Um, it's the same in universities and with the whole sustainability movement. The difference there is that the financial issues uh, are so large. For example, at Columbia University where we're working, they're in Manhattan. They have space problems. So the scientists do have to validate or read a journal article that says that this will work. Um, the strength that we have is that we're a bunch of scientists, so you know, we've done the work for them. Um, but when, they, when an institution has the space and financial constraints that we see, in particular on the East Coast, there's a lot more motivation to, to change and a lot more motivation to start with archiving samples as duplicates and move from there. I have a question for... Um Paula, and for Judy, if you could, well, actually, Bill, if you may have an answer, uh, answer to this, too. If you could wave a magic wand and cause something to happen on the UCSD campus that would help you meet the goals of your organization, whether it was providing you with MBA students or having a shared lab you could work in or d directing the research of our faculty or whatever, uh, what, what could we be doing here at UCSD that would help your particular organizations and the causes that are, have brought us here of preserving nature, of moving to a more sustainable future, um, how can we work better in partnership to help you be successful? Um, I, I have a request. Uh, the, the way that biomimicry is going to work is that there be more inter- cross-disciplinary um, communication. And uh, the world of biology, as far as I understand it, again, as an accountant, has been more of genus and species rather than function. And uh, what we're finding in, in, in our research internally is, is that people, it's hard to make the connections. It's hard to make the connection of why a whale flipper becomes the arm of a wind turbine. And um, it's that kind of imagination that comes with an openness to that interdisciplinary type of uh, approach. So the biologists need to talk to the engineers, need to talk to the chemists, need to talk to the engineering students, rather than work in this, um, in this what I see sometimes as a silo-based way of thinking. And so uh, creating an environment for that kind of cross-disciplinary dialogue, coming to the zoo, seeing what we have, Talking to one another and being open, uh, open-minded about these things is is something that's going to need to start and be nurtured from the preschool level all the way to the postgraduate level. So that that is, if anything's going to halt the opportunity for biomimicry to move forward, it's that lack of openness and, and cross communication. Okay, Judy. Well, thank you. <laughs> I, I'm not um, promising to deliver any of these things. I'm oh, just asking. <laughs> Uh, well, I would really, you know, it's already started here, and actually um, in the, out in the hallway conversation, there was a proposal to really start a program here beyond what, we, what the campus has done so far, because the campus has funded um, the technology adoption here. But an idea to take and have students to help transform from frozen storage to room temperature storage, to have a team of students or research assistants who can go in and catalog those samples so the university knows what its biological assets are and then move, actually move them out of the freezer. Uh, and send those teams, uh, a sample management team around the campus. Um, it's kind of an interesting dilemma. It's like cleaning out your closet. It's something you never want to do. And when you actually do it, you find uh, old treasures, um, 
things to give away to other people who need it. And it's usually not as gruesome as you can imagine, as you had imagined, which is really the same for taking a freezer down. Uh, Steve Wasserman's lab was a lab that uh, retired a freezer, and they were overwhelmed by the thought of cataloging and scanning barcodes in and seeing what they had and then moving them to this technology that is really simple to use. So we were able to go in there in a couple days and show them how easy it was, and it was done in a week. Um, but it was daunting at first. So at UCSD, I would love to see the university fund a team of students to go from lab to lab and start the transformation of this campus and unplug freezers. Okay. Bill, is there anything you'd like to see changed to make it well, easier? Well, I, I just have a comment uh, that I, I think is particularly exciting in the field of biomimicry, and that is linking biology of, of materials that on the ocean or on land with the material scientists, the, the bioengineering folks. Uh, I think bi that, that biomimicry is so it vast a subject, so uh, applicable to so many different directions that to really catalyze something that's going to be functional and result, have results, uh, perhaps it would be in material science. And I'll give you a classic example uh, of that, and that is the ultrastructure of the abalone shell in the ocean. This is essentially composed of two things, calcium carbonate and a protein that is both laid down by the abalone to create this shell. But if you've ever tried to break one of these shells, you'll know it's not calcium carbonate, which is not you know, very strong. Because, and it's extremely strong because of the matrix of how protein and calcium carbonate is laid down. And there's a lot to be learned about space age composites and creating different kinds of, of elements. Uh, you know, we saw the, uh, the Nautilus shell, and that's, that's an example. I don't exactly know how you'd use that. But uh, composites, it seems to me, for light and strength, having light and strong composites would be an area that you could actually create a mini symposium around. Well, and the abalone shell is also not made in a high pressure toxic environment with no. any no. external energy sources added from fossil fuels, so it's a great example. Hey, other questions from the audience? Yes, in the middle, you wait for the microphone. Oops. This question's for Paula. Um, I was wondering if you guys at the SD Zoo have had any programs working with local, like any any schools under the age of university students yes. to work towards the future. Because I know like um, our speaker has said that this idea of being open-minded and having interdisciplinary studies work together, you have to do it from a young age and only from there can we have success. So I would like to hear what you have to say. Yes, we have. Um, this past year, we've been working with High Tech High, both the San Diego and the San Marcos campus. Um, it was the focus of their year. They studied biomimicry. They came up with a problem. They came up with solutions. And they're putting out a book which describes uh, the whole process. And um, we found our scientists loved working with them because we found they were so engaged. It wasn't just lecturing to them. They were actually hands-on and understanding the animals and the, the, the different functions of the different feet. Like if you just took a tour of just the feet of the animals of the zoo, that alone is a, is a, is a complete education. So, um, so yes, they absolutely loved it. And then we've developed curriculum. Uh, we're now, we have an education department, and we actually educate 480,000 people throughout the year from little children to adults, but we have been incorporating biomimicry into our curriculum now. And again, the children love it. So um, we've been working on NSF grants to try to start doing research projects on how to develop educational programs that can affect um, this next generation coming up. Thank you. Up in the back corner. My name is Martin Rockstrom. I'm with uh, Rady, and I also developed the clean tech program for the Swedish American Chamber of Commerce. Uh, I have an, a question for Paula, but I open it up to all of you. And that is, uh, when I see biomimicry, I see a lot of design and a lot of uh, companies developing products uh, from a design point of view. 
So I want to ask you, what do you think the biggest threshold is to make company companies study uh, the biological and chemical processes? in the nature and then drive those and implement those towards commer commercialization and uh, what do you do and what would you like to be seen to be done more on that area? Well, great question because we're right in the beginning of it and that's, that's the, the nut we're trying to crack right now. The approach is really coming from a couple of different ways. It's, it's looking at the actual animals and understanding the functionality of the plants and animals and trying to understand and apply them. But it's also defining a problem, coming up with a, a, a defining the problem very clearly and then looking to the natural world to come up with the solutions. Recent, recently we did a design charrette with a very large Fortune 500 company where they had a specific problem and they asked us how do we solve this and we went to our curators and we went to our scientists and we came up with seven different potential animals or plants that could solve this problem. So, so the first I guess is really understanding what nature holds for us. A, a, an example is um, we have a, a consulting scientist that's working with us and he's, he's a genius. He just sits there and creates scenarios, looks at different species and says, what are the functions and what are potential opportunities down the road? And the polar bear is a kind of a, an important animal right now in the media. And one of the, one of the issues is how, does, how is it that a polar bear manages to keep this remarkable muscle mass? It's, it's, it lives in a very remote place. It has a very uh, a diet that's made up of one thing. Um, and, and, and what they found is um, that there's there's this an amazing ability to hold on to the muscle mass, and that has great applica application perhaps in the world of um, osteoporosis, in the world of atrophy, in the world of if you have invalids that are in bed, if you have space travel. You know, you start to just use the imagination about what this function can mean and how it can be applied. One, one animal and many, many opportunities, which gets to back to the question of why it's so important to save these species. Because once these species go, their mystery goes with them. Their genius goes with them. So in terms of the practical way of how are we trying to start businesses, we're trying to create a hub. We're trying to work with the community here in town and say, what is it? What are the basic business principles that we need to put in place? What are the, who are the people that we need to bring, bring around the table that can create the conversation that will then inspire businesses, inspire product development? So it's a great question, and that's what we're trying to put together right now. I had the fortune of participating in the first biomimicry conference that the zoo put on, and it was, it was really uh, amazing. The, the speakers there who came with products or processes that they had developed from the ideas from nature. It was amazing from you know, carpets, structures, uh, drugs and things that can help save lives or save the environment. It, it was amazing. I really hope that you know, the conference is repeated and, um, and that San Diego does become the hub for biomimicry, I think, in, in the U.S. Is that the goal? Yeah. Yeah. It, it was amazing, the products that they showed at this, at this conference. And actually, we were, our company did participate as a panel speaker there as, a, again, you know, a company that has taken the idea of nature and put it into practice. Yes, here. Yeah, my question is to uh, Dr. Miller Cohen, and that's, has anybody tried to use your technique for semen and for ova and reconstitute them, and is that viable, or does that just not work at that cellular level? So um, the, what nature produces has actually been used to a certain extent. The disaccharides have been used to stabilize uh, vaccines, so virus. Um, what we've done so far, we've, we've started with very simple structures, nucleic acids such as DNA and RNA, and now into proteins, but very specific proteins um, that have an application in particular for molecular biologists. As we get more and more complex, we hope to stabilize things such as eggs or live cells, but today we haven't been able to do it yet. We're still a pretty young technology and young company, but it is definitely in our plan to do that. We actually have 
kind of a joke around the company, which is when we're going to stabilize the beating heart. But so, you know, that's, that's really dreaming, but it is, you know, it is, we are on the path to stabilize live cells at some point in time. Judy, is your research done all in-house, or do you have university partners working with you on new development? We do most in-house, and then we have collaborators outside, both in industry um, as well as university. Okay. In the green shirt there. Yep. Hi, James McCloskey. I'm a student here at UCSD. I also am an intern at the Sustainability Solutions Institute. So I have quite well. The question is for all three of the speakers as well as Lisa. Um, what I don't know how familiar you all are with the classes that we offer here, but um, just as a broad question, what sort of classes do you think students should be taking, or what if there was just one class that a student could take that would be related to uh, green innovation or sustainability or anything like that? Even if you don't, even if we already have it and you don't know, just what do you think we should should be um, looking into for the students here? Let's start with you first. <laughs> Whoever. I'll try. Okay. Um, I don't know what the curriculum here is, but I am on the advisory board for San Diego State's sustainability program. And I was the only biologist, I'm the only biologist on that advisory board. So I was definitely very different than the architects and the industrial designers who are building that program. From a biologist's perspective, a, a course on looking at nature and building something out of it, such as the San Diego Zoo is doing, is, is, is fantastic. Um, my background is in not only entomology but microbiology, and so we've taken that knowledge and built products that have uh, are, can make an impact on the planet. Our goal is truly to make something that can cut down on CO2 emissions. So um, we've, we've been fortunate to look from uh, a biologist perspective, so what you have in probably the bioengineering department here, or the biology department, and model that with a sort of a biomimicry bent to it to see where you can go with it. It was interesting also at the conference that the zoo had, there, um, there was a, Arizona State apparently really uses biomimicry in their industrial design department, and so they had some, a really nice part of the presentation. So I would try and meld what the biology department does here with taking it and making products. Um, I don't know the curriculum either, but I guess I would say follow your passion. The world of biomimicry is so huge because the world of nature is so huge. So follow whatever it is that you love and look at it through the prism of nature and try to, uh, to come up with your own version of it until curriculums develop. Well, I do know the curriculum and uh, <laughs> well, you that's good. I'm not going to make any disparaging <laughs> remarks about our curriculum, but there used to be a field called natural history. And we have museums of natural history in which the wonder of life on our planet is demonstrated. And this is where mimicry is demonstrated. Today, at UCSD and almost everywhere else, uh, natural history has been replaced with molecular biology mainly. There are a few people left over who look at whole animals and look at natural history of animals, but the mimicry that we see now in biology has to do with mimicry at the molecular level, looking at mimics of DNA or mimics of polysaccharides that are natural components of nature. So the, the, the broadest picture that's represented, I think, by the zoo is almost gone in American science, as far as I can see. There's still components there, but, uh, you know, not, not again to make disparaging remarks about where we stand in terms of our understanding of biology at the molecular level, but we'd have to back up a bit if we're interested in looking at the physical adaptations of nature and looking at that concept in mimicry. And I would say that any course that requires students to work together in teams with people with different backgrounds and different expertise than they have around a particular problem from the real world. So find something that you think isn't working well 
and work together in a team to try to find a solution or a better way, I think would be a valuable part of everybody's education and would give you some experience that would be useful in uh, your future career. Um, there's a question down here in the corner. Hi, my name's Mark Lawrence. I'm a third generation San Diegan and a um, HERS Raider here in San Diego, California now. Um, this is something more for motivation points to find out what you think if this would be helpful for the future forums in motivations and incentives for all across all levels. Um, it's a marketing ploy to actually push, bring some of the sci-fi writers into your environment, bring them in such, even with Ray Bradbury, I remember seeing a presentation he did here with the civil engineering department talking about the designs of um, cities and the manner in which he, after spending, I think, three weeks with Walt Disney, had quite a, a, an interesting insight. Dealing with the people that we talk to or that motivate us and our younger children is a science fiction. And whether it was Jules Verne that almost set the precedence for what San Diego looks like today with everything with oceanography and the zoo and all the other aspects of what we read about as children, those are going to be, I think, the other catalysts. Those people will be the helpful catalysts to pushing forward more of the dreams and pushing the limits of what is pushing science, real science, into science fiction in making something that we might not think of outside of the box. I, th I think it's a it's a valuable point, and we do in the Sustainability Solutions Institute work with the humanities department here. Um, we've had student sustainability video competitions. We offered a science fiction competition last year, inspired by Kim Stanley Robinson, one of our alums, who's a very distinguished science fiction writer, and who enlightened me personally with this thought that science fiction is alternative futures, and sustainability is one such alternative future. Dystopia is another, and wouldn't it be nicer if we were all thinking about the utopias and not the dystopias? So it's, you make a very important point. The arts and the humanities are a really important part of communicating nature, communicating sustainability, and uh, engaging the community. Any of you want to add anything to that? Love it. Okay. There was another question in the back. Ali Esteglali and Vernium Corporation here in San Diego. This is a question for Judy. Uh, Judy, I work in the um, area of cellulose and fiber chemistry in the context of both paper making and, and biofuel generation. Drawing of fibers is always a big challenge in, for both paper making and for, um, for uh, biofuel generation. And I was wondering basically what happens when you dry a fiber mass, uh, the, the interfibrillar water disappears and as a result you get the collapse of the pores. And this phenomenon known as hornification affects the quality and the reusability of the, of the fiber. I was wondering if your technology in drawing DNA, RNA can be applied to, to, I guess, uh, cellulosic fibers, um, polysaccharides, different things? Yes and no. Actually, the, the original room temperature storage technology for DNA um, was paper. It was filter paper, and it's got a 20-year history from storing samples in a lab to forensic samples to newborn heel prick blood spots. The problem with that was that um, the samples got, get so trapped in the fibers that you cannot get the sample out over time, and uh, which is why we developed the technology that we did. We have polymer chemistry, and so it completely dissolves. Um, we do also have a drying step, as you probably noted. Um, the first products are really dry storage products, just like you see in nature, but they, they don't form um, these masses like what you see with cellulose, as I would imagine. Um, so they break up and go back into solution very easily. Um, you know, polymer chemistry, there's probably you know, many people much more knowledgeable than me uh, in that world. I mean, it's been studied for, for decades. Um, but it, it is a way to look at how to dissolve. That's really what, what we were looking for when we looked for a, a new way to store samples was we needed to dissolve something as opposed to get stuff stuck in fibers. And we actually took 
cellulose at the beginning and ground it up and tried to come up with something that allowed the samples to be stabilized, but at the same time when you added a reagent or water to them, they would, so to speak, come back to life pretty easily. You could get them out. And we, we were unsuccessful with uh, cellulose. Um, so that's how we got into synthetic chemistry. Hope that okay. helps. We have time for one more question down here in the front. Nathan Zeke with the Tomorrow Foundation. Thank you. Your passion for work that's helping us all is really inspiring. Um, I think all three of you could give some insight to this, but I, Judy, I wanted to direct this at you. Um, <clears throat> in your presentation, you really focus, and I wanted to kind of need to take a, put the marketing hat on, and in speaking as, uh, as a business person trying to sell your technology or really trying to change behavior, uh, I, I kind of term it as like the smart thing, uh, hey, we can put this in a postage stamp on this, it's much easier to, to deal with. Uh, the right thing, the CO2 emissions are much less, but also the profitable thing. And I'm wondering as you're approaching businesses, where's that mix? I mean, where are you finding that the, the most effective way, and, and in the end we're all trying to get them to, to use these better technologies. But when you're really approaching that, where is the sizzle? I mean, is it the profit, is it the, is it the efficiency? It really depends on who you're talking to at an institution. Um, if it's uh, at the CFO level, it's, it is about money. It's about plug load, you know, how much energy and what the cost of energy and square footage is in the region. As I, I mentioned, Manhattan versus San Diego or versus UCSD, very different cost structures. If you're talking to a scientist, um, you're really talking about sample stability. Scientists do lose samples. We've all had a freezer breakdown or a package that's gotten warm and we've lost a sample in transit or we know someone who has. So it's more of can we stabilize for how long and that this will really save samples from loss or degradation. Um, when you get down to the research assistance level, it's about how easy it is to use and how easy it is to get a lab organized. So we've, we have to sell to a lot of different levels. It is, yeah, it's a complex sale um, and it's complex marketing, but really it's the scientists who are going to change and use this technology. It's the PIs and that's not the easiest sell because in addition, for example, at, in at a university, they don't necessarily have the incentive to change. Now at UCSD, there's an advantage because they're paying for technology, and that's actually we're at seven of the UCs doing very similar programs and in a bunch of other universities uh, around the globe. But because labs are like little businesses and they pay overhead, you know, 50% overhead, unless that financial model changes where they're actually taxed for their energy used or the square footage, which is, which is what is going on in Manhattan. They're, they've run out of space. They're, that cost structure isn't conducive to someone changing. So, you know, you can have funding, you, but you need financial incentives to make that change. It, it really does. It's, it's a whole multi-level marketing and sales uh, opportunity. <laughs> okay, well, that brings us to the end of our allotted time for the Green Innovation Forum. I'd like to thank our speakers again. And our, our final Green Innovation Program for this year is scheduled for May 12, 2010. The program you have says 2009, but we do know that we're in 2010 now. <laughs> um, and the focus will be on knowledge and sustainability, and we will be publicizing the panelists and more details about the program when we get closer to the date. But please mark your calendars. Thank you all for coming. Have a lovely evening. And thank you, panelists. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you.